Hey, uh, welcome to the ITA. Actually, it's our first this year, right, Kelly? First of our present ITA's presentation series with Glass Pro Brewing. Um, thanks for coming tonight. I know the weather's not wonderful out there. I came from council this morning. There's eight inches of snow, and luckily my husband got up early and plowed us out. Or we would still be in my driveway in our little Subaru trying to get to the road. Um, I'm Melanie Vining. I'm the fairly new executive director. I've been on the job for about a year. Um, and this is really cool because when I started, it was in the middle of COVID and we weren't doing in-person events, we were doing webinars. And so I would get on these webinars and see names, but not faces or get on Zoom meetings and see faces, but not have you know actually met people. So it's just nice to be able to do some in-person events and, and get together again. So uh, thanks for coming out. For those of you who aren't familiar with ITA, we're uh, a nonprofit focused on maintaining and clearing Idaho's backcountry trails um, and also doing some outreach and education, some leave no trace, um, and presenting things like this just to get people excited about uh, different aspects of using trails and um, and just being public land users. So we'll uh, talk a little bit at the end about some events we have coming up. Um, we have got some information over here on our table. And feel free to grab a sticker. You can sign up for our email list. Um, there's a postcard you can take that tells a little bit more about ITA. Uh, and we have some really great trips coming up this summer, too. So if you're interested in volunteering and working on trails, we've got everything from half day projects. We've teamed up with Ridge to Rivers right out here. I know some people have really busy schedules and it's hard to get out for very long, um, all the way up to week longs where you can you know, fly or hike into the backcountry or get packed in by one of these awesome animals. So, um, you get to you get to hear about three different animals tonight. And as I was putting this presentation together with with uh, pictures from Ken and Irene, who will talk about goats and llamas, I thought, man, I need to have all three of these. I'm only a mule and horse owner, um, but they just have so much personality that I think it'll be a lot of fun to kind of learn about the different animals tonight and and their different characteristics and traits. Um, and afterwards, if anyone's interested in any of these, um, we all I got started. As an adult, I wasn't raised packing mules. Um, and you start into something like this and people like come out and want to help you and teach you and provide things to you and give you gear. And so if anyone's remotely interested in any of this, talk to us afterwards and we'll have some, uh, probably some good advice and resources, more than you wanted to hear. So, um, well, I'll get started. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I'm already off my spot. I needed a circle. So um, I was a backpacker for, you know, growing up, we had horses, but we didn't marry the two. We never took our horses into the backcountry. We lived in Nevada. We, you know, did 4-H and trail road. And so I was familiar with stock, but I had never used them in this way. And it seemed daunting and scary. Uh, and so when our kids were little, we did a lot of backpacking. Uh, this is my, my family, my son, Wade, when he was six, we were hiking in the snowy Bitterroot and pretty sure he's crying right there. So it was really <laughs> So um, we shortly thereafter had some friends who had stock. And, um, and this is our friend Marge. I blame her for my new habit of owning mules. Um, she invited me on a pack trip uh, and I just went along for the ride, literally. Um, and it was incredible. And it was like, this is a whole new thing to learn. Being out there in the woods in the backcountry with animals and kind of being tied to that tradition of using animals um, to move gear. I mean, it used to be out of necessity. Now it's more out of fun, unless you work for the Forest Service or you're an outfitter, but um, it was just a cool new challenge. We already had horses at home. We had two. So it's like, well, why don't we try it? And we certainly had some moments. I'm glad no one was watching, but uh, our kids loved it too, because all of a sudden they didn't have to carry that and they could just walk. Um, and they could also have a really nice camp. You can bring steak and good food and beer. Um, so it kind of opened up a whole new world for us, and we still backpack, but it's fun to go back and forth. So um, our stock, this time of the year, you wonder why you own livestock, but um, in the summer, this is why. I look back at these photos, and it's like, this is why we have them. So um, this is a picture of, of Marge and I. We had cut a trail open and, and done some packing in the Seven Devils, and we were coming out. And uh, this is in the Selway Bitterroot. Um, I helped some friends bring their stock in and out of the backcountry every fall and spring. Um, it's just a really beautiful place. So I think everyone, Irene and Ken will talk too, um, you know, the basis of packing is having a good pack saddle. You got to load all that gear onto your animal. Um, and of course, there's the rider with the riding saddle. But these are kind of the two 
typical saddles for packing. And there's a lot of tradition, there's a lot of opinion, um, whether you pack llamas or goats or mules and horses, um, everyone has a different opinion about how things should be done. But really these are kind of the two basic saddles. This is called the Sawbuck. It's a little bit, it's actually a lot older than the Decker. Um, they're used a lot in the Pacific, um, kind of in the West in California, in the Sierras. And there's a lot of tradition dating back to um, the Spanish who came and use these for packing. <clears throat> and then this Decker saddle is typically used in the Northwest, in the Intermountain West. Um, and it's, it's a little bit newer, it's developed by Oki Robinette and then the Decker brothers bought him out and were designing these. And this is more common, I'd say you probably see more Decker saddles in, around these parts than you do uh, Sawbuck, but they're both, both great pack saddles. Um, and they're kind of the frame on which you hang everything that you pack. And these are just some photos showing different ways of packing. Um, you know, the Decker has a, a tradition of using what they call mantis, manti loads. You basically take your load, you wrap it in a big white tarp and you tie it up and you hang it on your mule. Um, here's a picture of two wood boxes wrapped in those mantis and hung on the mule. This is in a, at the Bear Creek Bridge and so it's a really beautiful trail. Um, and this is on the Piet National Forest. That's our mule cactus. He likes having his picture taken. He hates being having anything behind him, so he's always at the back. Um, and cactus is using, these are called panniers, and there's hard boxes, soft panniers, all kinds of things, but um, that's really kind of the easy button when you're packing a lot of stuff is you just can put them in these bags and hang them on the saddle and, and down the trail you go. So, um, you know, some things that make life a little maybe harder than backpacking when you go in the backcountry is you're always worried about your stock and where are they? Do they have enough to eat? Um, are you making a big impact on your campsite? Um, that's, that is one thing, you know, hooves times, you know, four hooves times six animals can make a huge impact. Um, when you're backpacking, you can, you can leave your campsite and you don't have to do nearly so much rehab, but um, so when you're in the backcountry, you have to think about, you know, where are they going to be tied and you can turn them loose, but I don't sleep well at night when my animals are loose. Some people turn them loose um, all night long and just kind of tend to stick around and go tie one up um, and, and the rest of this. But this is called a high line. Um, this is along the Selway River. These are our animals tied up. Um, and that's kind of one of the main things you, you've taken with you. Um, it keeps them from away from trees. If you tie them to a tree, they'll dig a hole pretty fast. And then you, if you've been out hiking at all and you see big divots around trees, it's probably because they've had a horse or mule tied to that tree for a while. Um, and it's kind of unsightly. So here we're actually camped on a beach and the high water in the spring comes up and, and um, takes care of that. This is in the gospel hump near Wind River and they're on the high line. Um, and then feed is a big consideration. Irene and Ken will talk about their animals, and I think they have us beat when it comes to low maintenance. Um, and horses and mules eat a lot. And so where there's not a place to graze or where, somewhere they would impact it by grazing, you have to haul in your own weed free, either hay or cubes more than likely. Um, that's more the more efficient thing to pack. And so here ours that have no fags um, and they get their rations in the morning and at night. Um, but it's definitely uh, puts a dent in what else you can pack because you're taking feed with you. So you're using an animal devoted to carrying that. Uh, if you have ample grass, this is at Mosquito Ridge in the, um, or Mosquito Springs in the Frank Church, and Suede is wearing some hobbles. They can't move as fast, but they can move surprisingly fast once they figure those things out. It's a sight to behold if you're trying to chase one. Um, and he has a bell on, so you know where he's at. So you can sit down at camp at night and have your beer, and at least you can hear the bell. If the bell gets farther away, you know you better get up and go see what's going on. Um, one thing about horses and mules, I was going to talk about the difference a little bit later, but a mule is, stays pretty tied to its horse. So they'll hook onto a horse. And so we usually travel with some horses and mules, and then we can usually um, put one of our horses on either a picket line or tie them up, and the mule will stick around. They don't want to leave the horse. If you travel with just mules, Wade likes to leave, and he doesn't really care if he goes with anyone. So um, just some things to think about, and it'll be interesting as these guys talk to kind of compare how how it is to keep different animals around and in camp. Um, everyone has a stock losing story. We had a pack clinic this summer and we told, at night we were telling that story, another outfitter and I and um, another woman, and I said, I haven't lost my stock more than a half a mile. 
and the next day they left camp and went eight miles. <laughs> Might as well have just raised my hand. <laughs> and they went right back to the trailer. That's where they wanted to go. So. Um, this is just a photo kind of showing us, we start them young. Here's a catfish, our baby, he's three this year, and our dog Chuck. Um, they get used to dogs, they get used to being tied up, and being tied up for a long time without getting impatient. Um, and so starting something when it's young is a lot easier than trying to teach it something when it's a little older. Um, it's not, I mean, it can de definitely be done. They can learn at any stage, but uh, mules are naturally very curious. This is Ella checking out a, a Ouija board that one of our youth crews invented in Rapid River this summer. We rode in there to pack some gear into them and they were sitting around this stump and it was in the evening and it's like, what are you guys doing? And they had a pizza box they turned into a Ouija board. Um, and Ella really wanted to see what was going on. So uh, this is our mule Edna learning about pack goats. Um, she, we had a, we discovered she's terrified of them. So we had a friend, where's Taylor? Taylor's brother Zane has cat goats. He brought them to our house and graciously offered to lend them to us. And they could care less about the mule, but she thought they were going to eat her. Um, and then this is Catfish on his first pack trip. He just came along and they learned to just trail along behind their, their other mules and horses. And um, so starting them out young is kind of the fun part, I think. And then these are just some photos of some, some cool places to visit, whether you're a backpacker or you go with stock. Um, if you like stock, it's fun to sign up for an outfitter trip if you can. Um, they're pretty fun. It is just neat being out there with animals. They're curious. They have a lot of personality. They like people. Um, it's just, it's a neat feeling. It's a lot, it's more work um, and it's a little more worried because you're worried about where they are, what they're doing, and if someone's going to get hurt or sick. And um, But on the flip side, it's just, it's fun to travel out there with them. <clears throat> um, this is on the Sully River Trail near Covered Creek. Irene recognized the picture right away. It's like, I think everyone takes a picture there who goes down that trail because it's so pretty there. Uh, this is in Chamberlain Basin. Um, and then this is over by Myers Cove in the Frank Church on the east side. Uh, the chalice lets me some wave riding. Um, and then these are two young mules learning to get along. <laughs> um, they had to work it out, but um, but yeah, traveling with mules, it's it's fun, and they're you know horses and mules are really smart. They learn things quickly, and they remember things. So um, Edna and Ella took five minutes to work it out. Who was who was in back? Who was in front? Turns out we chose correctly. Sometimes you put them in the wrong order if you don't know the pecking order, and um, and they tell you pretty fast, but. Um, but, you know, they learn to haul things, and there's incredible things that mules have hauled over the years, you know, long timbers and bridge parts and cables, and so there are a lot of, there are a lot of things in the wilderness, bridges and, and um, lookouts that wouldn't be there had it not been for, for pack stock. So it's kind of a fun thing. You're always learning something, and there's always somebody who knows more than you can teach you, um, and, you know, just learning about the animals themselves. I just put a couple of resources here if anyone's interested. Um, Backcountry Horsemen, there are a couple chapters here in Idaho, more than a couple, but a couple locally here. Um, and they're always willing to have new members, whether you own stock or not. They'd love to have people come in and keep, you know, they love to share their knowledge and they put on a lot of trainings um, and they do trail maintenance as well. And then the Nine Mile Wildlands Training Center is actually over near Missoula and you can take a week long intro to packing class where you go stay at Nine Mile and they provide all the stock and all the materials and they, they teach you. And um, there, yeah, it's just a really good, good resource for anyone kind of interested in that. So we're gonna wait till the end of questions. I'm gonna hand it off to Irene Safra to talk about pack goats. Um, Irene was a former board member for the North American Pack Goat Association. She and her husband Carl had goats for 20 years? No, 13. 13. Um, <laughs> And uh, I've traveled all over the place, as you'll see in her photos. So I'll give it to Irene. All right. click Oh, do I do it? Or do you want to click? Oh, yeah, I'll let you do it. Thanks. Thank you, Mel, and thanks to everybody for coming out. It's great to see all these folks supporting ITA and um, and uh, here to learn about stock. So I'm here to do the pack book portion. And uh, they're kind of a non-traditional animal for packing. <laughs> but um, I live in New Meadows, which is close to McCall. And uh, we currently own five goats, uh, Buzzy, Ivan, 
<laughs> uh, Mario and uh, Ernie and Rudy. I almost forgot my goat's name. <laughs> so anyway, um, go to the next slide. Oh, and just uh, uh, just in the uh, let me just say, a lot of people use their goats for hunting. I'm not a hunter, but if you do have questions about using your goats to pack hunting camps in or using them for uh, game hunting, um, you can come to me or I can point you to the right resource. There's definitely people who use them for that purpose. I use mine for backpacking. And the reason that we got into goats um, is that we love to hike and we love to backpack, but um, we aren't getting any younger <laughs> and um, we just like to, bring luxuries like lightweight folding chairs, um, non-freeze dried food. I'd love to cook good food in the back country. So um, while we don't bring like heavy things like Dutch ovens, we do bring real food and um, try to do that. And, um, or we can pack foods if we go with friends, we can pack a little extra gear for them. And um, maybe a box of wine, maybe a flask of whiskey. So anyway, <laughs> so it's just uh, it's just nice to have a few extra luxuries and that was kind of why we got into it um and uh yeah it's just been a real it's just been really fun having them on the trail with us and having them as companions and as you can see they they like to be they like to be with us in camp um so let's see go to the next one anyway um this is a, just a typical i just wanted to show i get a lot of questions the big question I get is how much can a goat carry? And uh, so this is a typical gear setup here and there are many different kinds of uh, cross of saddles. This is just a traditional wood cross buck saddle, but you can get you can get other kinds of saddles too. And uh, just some soft panniers that we put the gear in. So, um, and then like any good answer, it really depends on how much they can carry. It depends on the age of the goat we're not supposed to put full, uh, full weight on a goat until they're three years old. And so the photo on the right shows a goat with just like a lightweight training pack. And so people get excited when they get young goats and they want to do something with them. So it's just a way of, you know, you can, they can carry a granola bar or two or just get used to carrying the pack. So um, anyway, but that the goat on the right is an alpine goat and it's a young one. And that's one of the more popular packing breeds. One of the other questions I do get is, what are the more popular breeds to pack with? So the one on the right is an Alpine, the one on the left is an Oberhausley, but people use many different breeds. I mean, people even use small Nigerian dwarf goats and they just carry very lightweight packs and it's just fun to have them along. So, um, but again, it depends. It depends on the age of the goat. It depends on the condition of the goat, um, how far you're hiking with them, the type of terrain you're hiking in, um, you know, how steep it is, how hot it is. But as a rule of thumb, people say 25% or less of the goat's total body weight. And we do far less than 25%. We generally don't put more than 30 pounds on a, on a goat that's in good shape. Okay, next one. Let's see. <laughs> so like Mel was saying, we start them also when they're young. And again, that's one of our young overhouses and uh, we just have a pack saddle on it and no, no panniers, but just get them used to maneuvering around with the pack, going over obstacles. And we also help uh, start them young, learning how to cross water. There's, there's, it's kind of a myth, but people say goats are afraid of water and they're so bonded to you. I mean, they're like part of our family. And so once you kind of get them used to following and going across water, they should be comfortable with it when they get older. But we try to start them doing that when they're young. And we've had some pretty, pretty sporty water crossings with them and they've, they've done well. So, <laughs> okay, next one. Okay, now I'm just gonna show a couple of typical camp setups for us. People also ask what we do with them at night and we also high lion our goats or low lion. We also, uh, if the weather's bad, if you know the weather's going to be bad, we pack a tarp and we can spring that over their, um, over their high line. And we also pack, if we know it's late in the year, we pack uh, coats for them. So um, if a goat gets wet and cold and gets pneumonia, it can kill the goat in just a, a very short time. So it's one thing that we have to be concerned about is just making sure. I mean, they can put up with pretty heinous conditions, but if they get wet and cold, it's, it's not good. So we just, we'll pack either lightweight tarp or coats. 
And um, in the summertime, if the weather's good and we know it's, it's gonna be good, then we, we don't need to pack anything, we just tie them up. Okay, next one. So I'll just talk a little bit about the advantage of goats. I don't know if it's an advantage, but it's a difference in where they can go. Um, they can go over pretty rough terrain and we do a lot of off trail hiking with them. So for instance, in the photo on the right, um, there's a, one of our goats climbing over a pretty big heavy down log, downfall, fallen trees. That's actually a trail that ITA cleared out, I think the following year. But, <laughs> so good job ITA, but we can actually uh, navigate over some pretty, pretty rough terrain, um, rock slides, tree slopes. And uh, the photo on the left uh, just shows that they are goats after all. They will occasionally scare you. Um, you just trust that they're going to make a good decision. So, um. <laughs> okay, next one. Let's see. Okay, I'm just going to quickly go over some places uh, where we hike, um, just, just quickly. Um, so, in the springtime, when there's still snow in the high country, we can go down to the Salmon River country. The photo on the left is the Gospel Hump, which uh, Mel showed a photo of it earlier, but it's just beautiful in the spring. And um, when there's snow up high and sawtooths, I mean, this photo was taken in probably late May, early June. And um, and the photo on the right is in the Hell Canyon area. But the nice thing about goats is that you do not have to pack food for them in situations like this. They're browsers. Um, they will. Um, browse on shrubs and, uh, and and new growth along the trail. And uh, so you don't have to pack pellets for them or anything. And uh, they're pretty light on the trail too, as far as their impact on trails. We try to choose campsites that have low impact and we do try to rehab our campsites when we get done with them. But um, in the springtime, there's plenty of them, uh, food for them to eat. And, uh, and we can pretty much, we can, with our location where we live, we can hike pretty much year round with our goats if we want to go down to the Santa River country and do some of the low lying trails. Okay, next. And here's just a few more scenery shots. Um, the one on the left is the Selway River Trail. Again, Mel showed a photo earlier of it and um, it's a, another uh, trail that you can do early in the season. And uh, so that was, that's a, just a gorgeous trail. We generally, the only other people we saw on this trip, I think, were rafters and uh, good fishing and just really, really beautiful trail. Uh, the center photo is Hell's Canyon. Again, you can do that um, almost any time of year. And so um, we've hiked, we've uh, hiked to Pittsburgh, uh, from Pittsburgh all the way up uh, past uh, Kirkwood Ranch and not all, I think we've made it to Bernard Creek, if you guys are familiar with that area. And then the bottom photo is uh, taken late in the fall. I think that was actually taken on Halloween of this year. So, you know, late October. And that's right in our own backyard. That's actually Fox Lake, if you guys are familiar with the, that area on the Payette National Forest. So, okay. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm going to wrap it up here with some of the more unusual things that we do with our goats. So the one on the left, they're actually pretty transportable, which is nice. <laughs> um, we've taken them on a jet boat. And uh, <laughs> even the captain was taking photos of the goats on this trip. So that was fun. Um, and uh, that was in Hell's Canyon. And uh, the photo on the right is uh, taken at Brundage Mountain in the springtime. We, uh, we hike to the top, or we, we put on climbing skins on our skis, and we take the goats with us. and give them a little adventure coming down. So they, uh, if you guys want to ever see some funny videos, I, uh, you can Google on YouTube, or you can look on YouTube, uh, goats and Brundage, or goats skiing Brundage, and I have four or five videos up on YouTube. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, they, uh, yeah, the last one I took was really a pretty good one. They were, one of them was doing 360s the whole way down. <laughs> okay, and the um, middle photo, um, so uh, we have several ultra runners, I think, in this crowd. But um, we help out and do an aid station for a 100-mile foot race called the Idaho Mountain Trail Ultra Festival, I Am Tough. And it's 100-plus uh, miles. And we help pack in uh, supplies to a 
backcountry remote aid station. This one was at mile 75 and uh, we help the runners out, give them food, give them whatever they need. And uh, it's an all night gig. And uh, then in the morning we pack everything up and hike out. But uh, we've got a lot of funny goat selfies from that. And the runners really seem to appreciate it. It's kind of a morale boost for them in the middle of the night uh, showing up and you know, they kind of, they've been told beforehand there's going to be these goats at mile 75 and they're pretty, they're pretty excited to get there and see us. So, um, yeah, I think, I think that's it. Next one. So just, uh, I'll just wrap it up here. Yeah. As Mel mentioned, I was a, I'm, I'm a member of the North American Pack Goat Association. If you want to learn more about goats, they have um, lots of links on their webpage and, um, you know, I mean, I just feel like my goats are part of my family. I grew up, I was a city girl, and when we decided to get goats, I had no idea how much I was going to love them. They're just a fun, goofy animal. They're, they all have personalities, and, um, you know, they're just a lot of fun to have along. So I encourage anybody, you know, who wants to learn about them to, to, to look at some more, um, some more information. But um, the other thing is, I was I was going to say is we're hoping to use them on a trail project next year. And so if anybody wants to sign up for that or uh, just learn more about goats, but I really enjoyed, I volunteered for a trail project last year and uh, I just think it's a great organization and I just want to help out any way I can. So thanks. Okay, we're now to the Llamas part before the Oh My and questions. Um, I'm going to introduce Ken Greger. A little bit about how long you've been using Llamas and all your history, but I'll let you take it away. Hello, I'm Ken Greger. I um, have raised llamas for about 35 years. I got into llamas originally by leading a llama around on a foothills cleaning project, you know, probably 37, 38 years ago. Um, my wife and I like to backpack. Uh, Ginny has a ruptured disc in her back, so she can't carry a pack any longer. And llamas were just a natural choice to um, go with. Uh, we can walk and uh, the llamas carry all our gear, so it was all great. We uh, started out with three llamas originally, and uh, they're kind of like Lay's potato chips. You can't have just one, and now we have 48 llamas. Um, so we actually got into llamas about 35 years ago. Um, from the photos here, Cusco is one of my sweethearts. He's just a gentle, easygoing llama. This photo was taken down at uh, Celebration Park. Uh, the other one is um, my grandson, who's a year and a half old. And one of the um, probably about a three month old uh, Kriya, the baby llamas are called Kriyas. And he's, Kriyas just checking out Ashton. Llamas are naturally very curious animals and they're always checking things out for us um, on the trail or wherever we go. Llamas are always looking, learning, checking things out. Next slide. Um, we go up into um, McCall area quite often. Um, the llamas are just natural at uh, you know going down the trail, crossing bridges or something. They uh, learn to do that very quickly and easily. Uh, there's a load of my boys in the trailer. They're all calm now. Llamas are, um, everyone knows or thinks they know, llamas spit all the time. Well, they do spit at each other quite frequently. It's how they establish their pecking order. I rarely get spit on purposely. Usually if I get spit on, it's two llamas spitting at each other and I get caught in a crossfire. What I get is, you know, six, seven, eight boys in my trailer. There's going to be a little spitting going on until the boys get things figured out because they're in each other's space and they don't like to have another llama in their space. So they're There'll be a little spitting going on until they get things figured out. Um, I've only had a llama spit at me once for absolutely no apparent reason. I have no idea why this llama spit at me. A llama spits at you, usually you know why. You're doing something to him that he does not like. And uh, you, you will know it. I 
number of years ago was scratching one of my llamas on the head and my buddy yeah. sitting with me camp goes he's gonna spit at you nah this is not gonna spit at me yeah he did eventually because llamas for the most most llamas do not like to have their heads or faces touched at all and uh pistol let me know no you, you don't need to be doing that i don't like it and uh, my buddy could see it coming i didn't and uh usually it's like he just kind of spit at me to let me know because sometimes he'll spit a green hay bale at you and it just smells nasty till it dries so you don't want to be spit on it i just very seldom actually get spit on by a llama um, next slide. Here's a uh, photo from um, hiking up in the um, uh, Boulder Mountain uh, area. We frequently go up to Rapid Lake. We're with some friends. We've got the panniers all loaded. We generally use a crossbuck type style pack saddle, aluminum crossbuck with the panniers on the side. and. Um, for the larger items that do not fit inside the panniers, we uh, will top load. We try to make the top load no more than uh, a third of the weight, total weight of the uh, panniers. Summertime, we're usually packing 65 to 75 pounds on the llamas. The newer trainees will get a lighter load. They'll get sleeping bags and sleeping pads. So they probably have, you know, 15, 20, 30 pounds on them. Uh, I try to start them out light when I'm training them. Usually. They don't get the pack saddles on until they're about three years old and at the trailhead. They just, they're checking things out at the trailhead. Everything's new. They're looking around, checking things out. You put the pack saddle on. They just kind of look, oh, what's that? Okay, fine. Oh. And they really don't even care that there's a saddle on them. And uh, training, they, they just naturally follow another line when we string two, three together, sometimes four together. We strung up to five or six together. If I'm uh, by myself hiking in, uh, if you have the right llamas, they all have their order they like to be in for the most part. Some, some like to lead, others will not lead at all. They do not want to be in the front. Um, some really don't care where they're at and others, um, you know, I had one, he wanted no other llama behind him. And so he always had to be at the back of the string. He did not tolerate having another uh, llama behind him. He just didn't like it at all. Um, they just go down the trail. They're quiet. They're um, hoof. They don't have hooves. They have a soft pad underneath like your dog's pad and a toenail over the top. So they're very easy on the trails. They um, basically leave, have less impact than a hiker in hiking boots when they're going down the trail. And uh, yeah, they're just great animals for hiking. If you don't mind walking, llamas are quiet. I take them hunting with me. Oftentimes they'll spot game before I do. Especially I have two, three llamas. And sometimes I'll be actually hunting and they go wherever I do. They pretty much, if you can walk it, a llama can get there. Next slide. We, uh, don't suffer too badly. There's um, Kellen, one of our llamas with our tent on top and two coolers of food and various adult beverages in the other one, I'm pretty sure of that. And our friend Doreen taking a picture with Cusco, photo op. Uh, we have numerous photo ops on the trail. Whenever we run into somebody, you know, they want to take a picture with a llama and llamas are usually happy to oblige. Um, they just are easy going and yeah, usually someone wants to pet them and we pet them on the neck is the most safest place to pet a llama. They really, I don't know if they like it, but they don't mind it. And so they'll let you pet them on the neck. And as long as you don't get up to their ears and face, they're fine with it. Um, one thing llamas rarely kick in 35 years, I've been kicked by a llama three times and it yeah, didn't even really leave a bruise. And I walk behind the llamas all the time. They, um, we have a dog, our, we have friends who have dogs. We go out on the trail with our friend's dog. The llamas seem to know almost immediately this dog belongs to our group and they're good with it. 
And after dogs running around for a couple of minutes, like, okay, this dog belongs. But if we come across another party with a dog on the trail, the llama's on alert and watching that dog uh, very carefully to make sure it doesn't get too close. Is they um, can and do stomp, you know, dogs, canines, whatever, with their front feet and do kick at them also. So we've had dogs come into our pastures thinking they were going to chase a llama. And uh, soon they soon learned that that was not a good idea. The llamas are chasing the dog back out of the pasture. I live out in the rural area and um, I have only in 30 years or well, 25 years where I live now, I've only seen one coyote in my pasture because the llamas will run the coyote out of the pasture. The coyote was to have nothing to do with something that's largest and llama, or, or llama chasing it. And thus, uh, people do use llamas for sheep and goat guards because they will run a coyote off. And they have to know to kill coyotes on occasion. So another use for the llamas is uh, some of my retired packers will go on to be uh, uh, sheep or goat guards when they can no longer pack. And they can usually pack until they're about 15 years old and they'll live to generally about 20 years. We've had one llama that we were boarding at lived till it was 28 years old, but usually about 20 years, 20, 21 years is how long, you know, llamas generally live, you know, 18 to 22 years, somewhere in that range. Next slide. And here's me getting things ready. I'm a vis very visual person when I'm packing up and uh, panniers need to be balanced. I like to have them basically the same size uh, I use uh, square four gallon buckets in some of my panniers to store my food, things that little critters can get into. And if they're in the plastic buckets with a lid on, the um, little critters can't get into our food and have a little snack during the middle of the night while we're sleeping in the tents. We uh, take a lot of food. We don't lose weight hiking with llamas for some reason. We take Dutch ovens. Aluminum Dutch ovens. Uh, I usually take some charcoal just because it's easier to cook with than uh, using wood fire. I do use wood coals also. Um, you can see our campground llamas grazing in the meadow. We generally do not take feed with us. If I'm going up high at the snow line early in the year or hunting in the fall where I expect the snow, I will take uh, some pellets, some weed-free uh, Timothy pellets along for in case the llamas can't find enough to eat. But they're uh, almost like goats. They'll eat just about anything. There's not a lot of things llamas will not eat. And uh, goat, there's a few things goats will eat that llamas won't, but there's not a lot. They're, uh, they're, they're grazing just about anything. They eat wild roses that I've had in my pasture, the Canada thistle. They're not real fond of um, white top. They do eat it somewhat, but uh, even these thorny wild roses, I don't know how they can eat those things without poking that nice soft nose of theirs, but they do. Uh, next slide. And here's a shot um, that's going down the trail. The one shot is hiking into um, Grassy Mountain, Grass Mountain Lakes. That's one of our favorite places for 4th of July. There's always a snowbank there to keep the food and beverages cold and uh, just a gorgeous, even though it's 100 degrees in Boise, it'll always be nice and cool up there. And that's one of our favorite 4th of July trips. And we always take a bunch of friends. It's not a long trail, so we can hike back to the trailhead and bring other friends in that can't make it the first or second day of the trip. and. Uh, usually stay three, four days up in there and it's just a beautiful, beautiful area. The other one we're going into, uh, yeah, the view is always the same except for the lead llama. And that one, I believe we're going into, um, um, ah, put blank on here, into the lake uh, where the plane crashed up uh, northeast of McCall. Uh, next slide. And um, I do rent llamas out. This shot is my grandson with his first deer he shot and Kellen standing in the picture there will um, 
shortly be packing that deer out. And he'll have, I think with that one, he had about 90 pounds on him. Uh, we didn't have too far to go, it was a pretty easy trail, so he could pack the 90 pounds. Kelly figure uh, adult llama can pack up 25% of its body weight. And most adult llamas weigh like 300 to 350. And uh, generally they're about 330. So 25% is percent of his body weight, we're looking at 85, 90 pounds and uh, they, can, uh, they can handle that weight if they're conditioned. I'm not gonna put that weight on a, um, you know, first time out in the spring or so forth, but these guys have been out quite a bit. So they're in shape and they can uh, handle the weight. Uh, I do not generally pack that much during the summer because llamas do not take the heat real well. They, um, you gotta be a little careful uh, during the hottest part of the year and you know, take it easy or you know, stay in the shade or you know, try to hike during the cool of the day. And uh, especially if you're, you're there packing a heavy load you know, up a steep trail, you gotta take it really easy. I have had llamas overheat and just say, I'm done. And uh, you just you know, give them a break, let them rest for a while. And sometimes we let one less a couple hours come back with a llama that could take it better and took all his gear and put it on the uh, the, be the better llama that it wasn't uh, heat exhausted and packed out that way. I uh, string out the llamas in the meadow generally on a ground line. I'll put three to four llamas on each line, time off so they're far enough apart so they can't get tangled with the ropes and that way they get a, quite a wide area to graze on and they can pick pick what they want to eat because you know they'll always pick the best stuff they won't just eat everything indiscriminately they'll pick what they like first and it just um less impact on the meadow and so forth that they can move around more and not eat everything way down in one small circle and so forth so yeah there and we've been in the spot numerous times and you go back the next year and you don't even know the llamas had been there the previous year other you might see some llama droppings on the ground from the previous year next slide and here's a little example of um what we take for um our cooking we take a double burner uh coleman Propane stove, usually we have a couple of aluminum roller tables so we get our food up off the making breakfast here and we're having uh, bacon and huckleberry pancakes that my grandson and I went out and hiked three miles till we finally got to the huckleberries to uh, pick huckleberries for breakfast while everyone was sleeping. We took off and got the huckleberries. Um, there's an instance that's my uh, hunting trip there in the snow. We um, for that trip, we did take pellets along for the llamas to eat because, yeah, there was not a lot for them. They do eat pine needles and will eat some pine tree. They'll chew on the bark occasionally too, but uh, not real nutritious for a llama. So uh, in those kind of instances where we expect conditions like that, I do take additional feed for them. But it has been the um, exception rather than the rule. I don't think I've done it more than every two or three years where I've run into conditions like that where I needed to. Um, some of the hunters that rent llamas from me will, uh, I, if I, they expect snow or we expect snow, I do send pellets along just in case they need them for the, the uh, llamas to eat. Uh, next slide. Here's an example uh, running into snow. This was in the uh, Bighorn Crags. Um, near Birdbill Lake coming out of there. And uh, yeah, we had us went on an elk hunt. It turned out there was no game in there, but yeah, we had this uh, snowy trail to go on and uh, the llamas did just fine on there. They, I had them walk through, uh, they've been walking through snow quite often. I've had them in uh, snowy conditions and they don't seem to mind it. They've got enough fiber and wool that the cold weather doesn't generally bother them. I did have one instance where we were up high, there was no protection for the wind and we had 
rain mixed with snow and high winds and the llamas got wet and they did get cold with the high winds and beating down rain. Eventually it, they did get soaked through, but usually the, the water just rolls off and you look underneath and they stay dry, but the conditions are nasty long enough. They eventually will get uh, wet through and through and get cold. So you have to be aware it's the exception. It rarely happens. Next slide. And here's uh, me doing a little trail clearing to get the llamas through. There was no way to get through. I have a uh, battery operated chainsaw. This was a pretty sizable log for that little 12 inch saw, but we did get it cut through so we can get, this was in going into 20 mile lakes. Um, I started carrying a, I do have a handsaw also, but this would have been impossible with my handsaw to get through there. But fortunately I had this uh, little chainsaw I started carrying with me as I'm getting older and don't like to handsaw everything anymore. And uh, so, yeah, we we do some tra trail clearing just as we're going down the trail, just because it just makes it easier for everyone. When we come back out, we don't have to go through over some of these obstacles. That one, will, yeah, we just couldn't have gone around it. It was just too dense of uh, brush and rocks and so forth. So that one we had to clear or go back somewhere else. Next slide. That's it. <laughs> um, um, I'm trying to think of anything else on llamas. They're very curious. They learn very quickly. Um, llamas, when I'm training them on the trail, one thing I have to train them to do is walk through streams. Their natural instinct is to want to jump over water. And you don't want a loaded llama jumping across the stream if you're standing on the other side of it. And you know, 350 pounds of llama plus gear will uh, lay you out flat. I've seen it happen to a lady who had trained her llamas to uh, walk through water. And yeah, this llama came flying across the creek and laid her out flat. And so that, that is, other than that, they seem to learn. They don't like mud real well. so. They're kind of persickety about that. You got to kind of train them to uh, go through mud. But going down the trail, they just pick it up. And the experienced llamas know exactly how wide they are. I've had a llama. I tried to get him between two trees and he stopped. It's like, I'm not going through there. I can't get through there. And it's like, yes, you can. Finally, I convinced him he could. And he could get through there. But the experienced llamas will go around a tree or a rock and not even brush the panniers on the side of the tree because they know exactly how wide they are. The inexperienced one, it, it takes them a year or two to figure it out exactly how wide they are. But they figure it out and you go down a trail and you think, well, he's going to scrape on this rock. But no, he goes right around it and doesn't even scrape the pannier on the rock or tree or whatever we're using. Uh, where, well, it's, uh, I've had panniers. I have still have my original set of panniers that uh, I use. A little worse for wear after 35 years, but they're still usable, which I think is pretty impressive for a set of pack gear like that that gets used pretty regularly. We uh, get out several times a summer, uh, you know, sometimes, and I go hunting several times, plus they get used for people renting the llamas uh, numerous times a year. So uh, they're pretty much busy during hunting season. I almost always have at least two or three llamas out helping some hunters pack out their game. They, um, you know, they see a dead deer or an elk. It's like, oh, oh, just sniff it. Okay, it's a dead deer. Okay, fine. Yeah, they don't care. Uh, packing it out on their back. Um, I had a bear come into a trailhead camp once and well, we had a truck right there. So I never tried to put a bear on a llama. I don't think he'd appreciate it too much, but I haven't tried it. Cougars, llamas do not like cougars. We've run into cougars on occasion and we didn't see it, but the llamas must have smelled it because they didn't want to go. And actually, the next day, my buddy did see a cougar in the area. And so we figured that's what happened because we'd only, we broke camp and hiked a half mile with the llamas and they didn't want to go. And it's like, 
you know, we couldn't figure out what was going on. And I'm pretty sure the cougar was in the area and they could smell it or sense it. And uh, they didn't because the guanacos out in South America, the uh, puma down there is their big natural enemy. So yeah, cougars and llamas, yeah, they don't like like the, the cougars at all around. And bears, they, well, they were, they were on point. I had a bear come in the trailhead, got in the back of my truck, and this bear came in to see if he could find any more stuff in my truck. And the llama saw the bear, and they were all on point, all looking at it. I had seven llamas, and every one of them was on point looking at that bear. I knew exactly where he was. And um, yeah, he's on my wall now. Got my first bear. I always wanted a bear skin rug and finally got it. So that uh, kind of made that hunting trip because we didn't see any other game. Um, that's basic llamas 101. So hope you enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, I'll, anyone has any questions when you see me at any of the meetings? Grab my. Collar and we'll talk llamas. Thank you.